Thank you everybody for showing up here today. Uh, my name is Justin Perry. I'm the CEO of Conduit Innovation. Uh, the story that I'm going to tell you today ends up with how to better realign your organization for success, and that's any organization, almost in any field of any size. The business, uh, having started the business you know, several years ago, every single day is a learning experience. And often what I'll find is it's become sort of like a mantra. Everything is interconnected. The stories that we go through, sometimes like today, on the way to clients, to talk about how to help them inform some of the business strategies that are ultimately deployed within the clients themselves. So we're going to start out with a little bit of a story, and then we're going to go into exactly what and how this applies. So when I started the business, one of our first clients, it was an internal reorganization that came actually as a byproduct of a website redesign. They are located in Long Island. So I'm a big fan of in-person meetings. I believe in understanding not only the business, but understanding the people within the business. As you'll soon find out later on, the people in the business, they're the single biggest uh, variable when it comes to transformation or innovation of any kind. Their willingness or unwillingness to accept a new way of thinking. So as part of the story, it starts out with we're driving down to Long Island because, as it turns out, there's really no easy way to get to Long Island. Um, so we decided that we were going to go ahead and drive down to uh, the ferry. So there's two ferries on the way to Long Island. And I, uh, I said to myself, we'll just get to this one, and we'll get there in plenty of time. Well, I missed the first ferry by four minutes. No problem. There's Bridgeport, Connecticut. It's about an hour and 15 minutes away. I'm sure that we'll get that one. No big deal. I missed the second ferry in, by four minutes. So, so much for my new car at that time. So much for uh, me trying to break the sound barrier, trying to get there. So at that point in time, a, a panic washes over me. What's going to happen? Are we going to be really late? Long Island seems like it's really far away, and we're going we're to hit traffic. But no problem. We'll just drive straight through. At that time, I, had a, I got a new vehicle. And the, the vehicle was literally days old. It was basically an iPad on wheels. I didn't know how to use the car. I knew, I knew how to drive it, I just didn't know how to use the navigation and come to find out that I didn't, actually didn't activate the navigation. My CTO who was with me pulls out her iPhone with a cracked glass front. She goes, well, I have Waze. Well, what's Waze? I guess I was the only person that didn't use it. We pulled it up and you know she has 10% battery left and I don't have a charger because it's a new car. Yeah, I'm in a really good mood right now. So we pull it up, and I'm actually really impressed. You know, she's holding it up because I, I hadn't activated the interior Wi-Fi of the car, so she's holding it up out of the sunroof to make sure that she gets connectivity. And we're, we're making progress. And one thing that's great about Waze is, is that it tells you when it's going to be there and uh, when you're going to be there, and it constantly updates until we, start, we get close enough to Long Island and we're adding 20 minutes at a pop because we're hitting these traffic pockets. And now the beads of sweat are starting to run down the side of my face. Now, it should be known, for those of you that, uh, that don't know me, I'm habitually late. I was early today because I kind of have to be to, pre to, to present this. But, <clears throat> but uh, you know, a half an hour late is an hour early, as far as I'm concerned. And it's not something that I take pride in. We're all a work in progress, right? But um, so the clients typically know that if we're late, we sort of let them know that it ahead of time, and they don't mind because when we come there, we make it happen. But it still doesn't decrease my level of stress. But we ended up being a little bit late. What, to my surprise, Waze would come back later on, not an hour later in that meeting. How we started the transformation process with this client is because when we started working with them on the website redesign, the first question that I had as part of our discovery was, how are sales this year so far? It was in June. The answer from the head of sales was, well, not so great. I said, how come? He goes, well, we have, they happen to be a, a company that works with retail retailers, and they have third-party retail reps out in the field. Well, you know what? Our reps tell us the same, that they're doing the same things that they did last year when you, things were better, but they don't know why things aren't going well. I said, okay. 
not being judgmental, because you can't carry a predisposition when you walk in and deal with companies. Every company is different. The challenge lies in finding which ways we can get them into some sort of a structure that we can problem solve. If these things were easy, they wouldn't call us, right? So I think you know, the challenge is being able to sift through the facts to be able to get to uh, a string of events that we can then measure against. So my comment to this gentleman was, OK, so sales are bad. The reps out in the field. How much do you pay these reps in commissions? They don't even work for you. About $1.8 million a year. OK, that's more than your marketing team makes in aggregate, plus your marketing budget. To third party reps that are making commissions. Are they making commissions because they're actively selling? No, they're taking care of our customers. They're kind of like account reps. We just commission them off of, off of a product that sells. You mean that the retailer sells? Yeah. OK, it so doesn't sound like it's a commission. It sounds like it's just free money, as far as I'm concerned, right? So they're not giving you valuable feedback from the field. So what is your intention to do to turn things around this year? Well, the year's half over. We're seasonal. OK, so this year's terrible. So when do we wait to find out what we're going to do for next year? When next year's terrible in June? That's why people either like me or hate me, because I tell the truth. You have to tell the truth when you're helping companies change. You have to be comfortable putting yourself out there, like me right now, when it's uncomfortable. So in the meeting, we get to this methodology that I invented many years ago. It's called Smart Tech Convergence. Before we talk about Smart Tech Convergence, let's talk about how Waze came back. The CEO of the company, 67-year-old gentleman, the company's been in, uh, it's a family company that's, that's grown uh, exponentially. And you know he's forgotten more than people will ever know about the product that they happen to sell, which is fudge. Who knew fudge was such a big business? But it is, uh, for, certainly for them. And you want to show you know, great respect to them. And the gentleman has a lot of analogies. And I have analogies, too, like Waze. He says to me, he goes, sometimes you know, when I'm thinking about solving a problem, I think back about this app called Waze. And I said, you, you wouldn't know. I just had you know, a living hell with that getting here. And he, and he goes, when I think about how I'm solving a problem and things aren't working, I think about when, I, when Waze is giving me directions and they just don't sound right. It sounds like it's bringing me in the wrong direction. And mentally, I'm thinking about the story when GPS first came out of the lady that was following the, her GPS and drove her car into a lake. But like, really, mentally, it, it immediately hit me. These moments are valuable because the CEO of that company wasn't talking about ways. He was talking about linear thinking. He was talking about the decisions that we deprive ourselves from by making decisions that were just made. So it's kind of like I look at it as like a choose your own adventure book back in the 80s, early 90s, where that's where my childhood was. You, you start, turn to page 50, make this decision, turn to page 75 or page 30. Smart tech convergence basically is a way to take the linear thinking that all companies have to deal with and really apply that into a methodology that exists to eliminate the variables why companies do not succeed. If you don't know the clear answer to a question, and the things that you're measuring, because we all measure things. It could be a marketing KPIs, which could be number of leads, visitors to a website, conversion rate, digital metrics, social shares, all of these things. These things we all hang our hats on in some, in some instances. For sales, close rate, sales cycle, uh, attr attrition, et cetera. For the client services or customer service experience, it's, it's longevity, it's attrition, it's year over year growth. But all of these things are being measured in a silo in multiple silos. And what are we doing? We're actually taking technology platforms to try to help automate that measurement of things that aren't stringing the dots together. But in and of itself, it's basically saying it's the, uh, it's the antithesis of how ways should function. But the gentleman, the CEO of the company, basically said, hey, listen, Justin, when I get to that point, I reboot ways and I start it up again. And it picks up at my previous destination, and it reconfigures the route based on what the situations are today. Wouldn't it be so simple if this company had just taken the CEO's advice a year prior? But we don't, because we're too close to it. Because we're like ways. We don't know that the breadcrumbs that we've laid for ourselves mentally have brought us to this point, which is a living hell, which is why you're calling me to come help you. 
So smart tech convergence is a way to basically get non-technical people, business people, people in IT, people in sales, people in marketing, and people in the C-suite to all agree because at the end of the day, sales, marketing, and technology must converge around the customer. The customers are the answers to all of the questions that we want to ask ourselves, and we're going to get into it. This is the one way where we can actually use the idea of rebooting the way that we think about business to help measure things more effectively. So what is smart tech convergence predicated on? It's basically saying that the, that the answer is no longer simple. It might be obvious, but it's made less obvious because of the ways people in these silos are thinking. And it's not the people's fault in the silos. It's the way the companies are configured. The way the companies are configured today are all like IBM used to be, right? It's, it's sales, it's marketing, it's technology, it's finance, it's operations. And in the best cases, they play nice. In other cases, they're tenuous friends, right? And in other cases, they hate each other. In any case, it's not that people don't want to work together. It's that what they're measuring is, the, is a porthole view of an ocean of possibilities. And those portholes do not ever align. Therefore, they cannot cross collaborate and help each other. So how are we going to unify all these people? If, we, if you were to agree with me for a moment and say, the people in company are the greatest risk to transformation or change, the answer is not to abandon what these people know and have come to build their successes on. The answer is, is to take those things and find a common ground. And the common ground in any company is the customer. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you how we can apply the, the mentality of rebooting the way that you think about your business and not abandoning what it is that you currently measure, but finding that umbrella that makes it work for everybody. So first, the approach that we take here is, instead of saying it was definitely this or it was definitely that, we go into a situation by saying, how, why did things happen and what could we have done differently? A lot of people, really everybody, and myself included, will always talk about, gee, didn't that stink that happened yesterday? Or, I'm so upset this happened to me. People who understand why things happen can then predict what will happen. People who understand and can predict what happens because they understand why can control what will happen in the future. People who talk about what happened are victims. That's, unfortunately, that's the situation that most of us find ourselves in because in today's day and age, there's too much information, there's too many ways to spend money, there's too many places to waste money, there's too many places to market to people, and nobody wants to be sold anything. People hate salespeople, but they want to buy. Four, a couple years ago, 60% or more people weren't sales ready until they, until they decided that they wanted to call the salesperson, and when they did, they wanted to place the order because they use the internet to be able to understand what it is they want. People are still lazy. They still want what they want when they want it. They just, don't want, they just want it to be super relevant, right? So there's too many places to possibly find that silver bullet. So we have to eliminate the reasons why we would fail uh, to be able to triangulate the solution. In the scenario that I talked about in this, in this company in Long Island, it's not that this company is a great company that we worked with, but it's, it's indicative of a lot of companies that we've worked with in that people are measuring things, and because of the counting stats, everybody's excited about where the business is going. But what happens is it looks a lot like this. Yes. Yes. Just thought you might want to know, uh, sales aren't up, they're, uh, they're down. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. So the idea here is, is that you know, the fact of the matter is when sales are down, then it's time for a change. But ultimately what happens is, is you have as little runway as you ever have. You don't have the budget that you had before. You don't have the tolerance internally that you had before. And nobody knows why what used to work doesn't work so well anymore. And that's a threat to everybody's professional existence, right? So if the people in any company are the risk to change, and the reason for change is because things that used to work don't work anymore, 
how can you begin without alienating everybody in the organization and having a revolt? That's why the customer is so valuable. It's the one thing that everybody can agree upon. So here's the deal. What, what are the different reasons why we didn't succeed? I suggest we look at it this way. Reasons why you definitely didn't succeed, reasons why you probably didn't succeed, and reasons why you possibly didn't, could, didn't succeed. This is a way to have internal di dialogue within your companies that is inclusive. It's brainstorming sessions. Anybody can talk about what might have gone wrong, and anybody can catalog these things logically, but you're beginning to foster that common ground. I'm of the opinion that if you don't understand what you, what, how to solve a problem or what the solution is, you can back into what the solution is by eliminating all of the things that are not solutions. I joke with people that I founded an innovation company because I made mistakes. I just don't make the same mistake twice. So I literally do what I, I don't do everything that I used to do that was wrong, and you find the right. Where do your problems fail? Well, we talked about the people, but it's really, I think, one of four things. It's people problems, process problems, data problems, and platform problems. The people problem is the most difficult to solve. Why? Because everybody has an excuse. Everybody has a reason. So we say, forget about the people problems. We're going to have that be the last thing that we solve for because all of these other things will help triangulate true measurement. So uh, the inability to measure. So the process problems, data problems, platform problems, they're indicative of that linear line of thinking, the wrong thinking of the, of the original Waze app, right? So when you decide that you want to do things that differently, and you understand that the people, are, are the people in your organization are the, are the things, the most valuable asset, you have to position them for success, then we have to understand the role of all of these things, and the role of all of these things also in why things don't work as well anymore, right? I have the luxury of not working at any of the companies that I work with, therefore I have a clean slate. I'm the only one in the room that has the clean slate. Everybody else created these processes Work actively work in these, pro, uh, in, in these platforms. The idea here is that nobody's wrong. It's just that everybody's half right. And we need to, we, there's, there's, there's safety and solitude in that. So the inability to measure, which is, a, which is a derivative of misaligned data, platform, and processes, misaligned with what is really important, which is a customer behavior for any company, is the root of why the KPIs in sales look okay, but sales are terrible. The KPIs in marketing look okay, but sales are saying the lead quality stinks because we can't close any of these deals. It's a constant finger pointing thing. Head of IT is saying, I used to be able to be the king or queen of my castle, and now I have MarTech, now I have sales technology platforms that are basically invading what was once something that I took very much pride in as a closed ecosystem, and now I've got to deal with non-technical business people telling me what they want, and I am used to getting business requirements. Sales marketing in, in the C-suite simply just want to solve the problem, and they fall victim to software sales uh, promising the world. But ultimately, you have to integrate these things with the people that you don't have, with the knowledge about your business that you should, would like to have, but don't, and you become uh, uh, slaves to technology uh, instead of technology being an enabler. So if we understand that, we want to take, how do we fix all of that? Well, I talked about starting with the customer. I want to talk about, instead of sales and marketing and customer service, I want to look at customer acquisition and customer retention. I believe that, mar that marketing and sales are merging into one moving forward. Why? Because I said people don't want to be sold anything anymore, but they want to buy. So the idea of being relevant, the idea of being timely, the idea of being, being able to help people make those decisions is what the new marketing is nowadays. The what do I have to do to get you in this car isn't working anymore. Great salespeople are born, they're not made, I don't care what anybody says in the sales training field. 20% of your sales force is on the way out, they're about to get fired. The people in the middle, they're not gonna be the best, they're not gonna be the worst, they're gonna be steady Eddie, and that's the reality of it. So it's, and that, by the way, that's true in almost every company, in every, in every department, but at the end of the day, it's, a, it's on the company to position those people, regardless of what the skill set is, regardless of what it is that they quote unquote do for success. And there's a way to do it if we focus on customer acquisition and retention. This is where we need to re restart our ways organizational app, right? So what now? So the idea here is, how do we take the theory to tactics? 
Well, what I talked to you guys about earlier is, is that we can't just jump into the unknown, right? We gotta just start with where we are today, where we are comfortable. It's not that your sales process stinks. It's that it's not as effective as it used to be. We can all agree, that's obvious. What we don't know is what we need to do about it, right? So mapping your internal sales process, the sales process is a mirror image of the customer's buying process, or at least it should be, right? So a lot of the solution-based sales is a requirement of salespeople diagnosing what the customer needs. Well, what about if marketing was able to understand the customers better and prospect specific customers better to anticipate those needs to then better tee it up for sales? Then you don't need a salesperson that was born great. You just need somebody to be able to be helpful. That's a place where many more people than your rainmakers live. They want to be helpful and they want the results for that help. So mapping your internal sales process against what you think you're buying your buyer's processes is a good first step of being able to look in the mirror and say, am I on the right track? Next. Understanding your sales organization. Having run sales organizations in the past, you know, we have the leaderboard, right? Nobody wants to be at the bottom of the leaderboard. What about this? What about the metrics that you say, new deals closed, top line dollars, attachment rates, all of these things that people look at is like, you're a great salesperson. Maybe if the company started to say, those are meaningful, but what might be more meaningful is to understand the customers behind those numbers. I might be a really bad salesperson at closing a certain type of customer, but your best customer company XYZ might look a little bit different. They might stay longer. They might buy more. They might be more loyal. And maybe, just maybe, because of how you're judging me, I'm actually one of your more valuable salespeople. I'm just selling to people who aren't those people and a little bit of those people, right? So the idea here is, is to understand the sales organization. Well, how can you do that and, and measure that? Well, it's not, about, it's not about abandoning close rate, sales cycle, all of these other things, all of these KPIs. It's about understanding the customer segmentation behind those KPIs. Taking a look at the attributes of your customers. It's not just about the buying persona. Yeah, we all go to a trade show. Yeah, we all look at digital. Yeah, we all like referrals. We all look at white papers. We all uh, you know, have to uh, make purchases seasonally. However, that, that's a different story from a marketer's perspective than it is for a sales perspective because the sales, a salesperson wants to close that customer. Well, if the customer doesn't want to be sold anything, then it's important for you to be able to really immerse yourself in what a day in the life of me, which is a variant of a buyer or a customer of yours because of industry, because of job title, because of subsets within the industry, and we typically use SIC codes, things like that to begin classifying at the business level. We ask our customers, our clients, forget about th what they buy. Why would they decide to buy? And it's oftentimes a dynamic that's inside the company or the industry of that person. I'll give you an example. This company that we worked with is in the retail space. They're a retail program provider. So they have to work with, uh, you know, with these buyers or brokers. Well, these buyers or brokers, they're always looking for the next thing, but they're not highly motivated to change if something's already working. Well, what's a motivator? Brick and mortar retail dollars leaving for online, maybe? Amazon, maybe? Well, is that enough? No, it's not enough. It's that the fact that their boss is saying, we need, to, we need to get closer to our customers. We need to have more people come to our stores. We need to have more people buy more things. We need destination items that are different. Well, why are they saying that? Not because it's a great idea, because it is. They're saying that because they're feeling pain because they've, they've got a ton of overhead in these supermarkets that are like, they're not Whole Foods, they're not Market Basket if you're around the area, they're kind of like those tweeners that like high rent, high expenses, not really known for being great at anything, and high prices. That's a loser, right? Especially when people have choices. So if we understand that the grocery industry is like that, then we look at big box retail. Well, what's big box retail? It's Target. Target these are hypermarkets of the future. What's happening at Target? The self-checkout aisle is becoming a convenience store within the large retail store with different pegged products and things of that nature. Sounds to me like that's a sales opportunity. I don't know. 
But I can tell you that that's not the case in grocery and the same amusements and recreation, things of that nature. It's just different flavors. The environment shapes the business needs, shapes the want and needs of the customer. But how can you possibly pay attention in that granular of a detail to all of your different types of customers? Well, you apply these attributes and you link the revenue performance. How much are they buying? What, what matters to you? Documenting the sales funnels, you could find that certain types of customers have the biggest initial order. Certain types of customers have a smaller order, but they stay longer or they buy at a higher frequency. Certain customers might not buy at a higher frequency or in big amounts, but they buy margin-rich product lines. These are all the vitamins for any company to be healthy, right? But it's a mixture of what those attributes bring to a company, which is really what the company wants. They don't want to drop, drive top-line sales at the risk of margin. They want to drive good business, right? That causes us to have to be disciplined enough. Well, how can we possibly be disciplined enough? If we understand the industries, if we understand the attributes around our customers, then we can do market research to tell us how big is the pool of, uh, is the pond that we're fishing in. If we only want red fish in the pond, how many red fish are there? How many boats are competing with us trying to catch red fish? All of these things are knowable. We're beginning to take measurement that we already are doing and we're using it in a more focused way to triangulate our internal GPS around what's important. Documenting the sales funnels is a way to benchmark customer groups against one another and really take those KPIs to the next level. Evaluating performance per segment. We took all of the customers, 3,000 customers, and we took 65% of those customers and divided them into four segments. And then there's other. Other is still important, but the most important are four segments. Why? Because we don't have unlimited amount of money, unlimited amount of people, unlimited amount of time. These segments are valuable to us because they're in an industry that's, that's, that's desirable to us, they perform in a, way, in a way that's great for us, or it's predictable. If you understand how your segments perform, you can now, in marketing, put a dollar amount on what you're willing to pay for one of those customers. Why I say that sales and marketing are becoming customer acquisition and retention is because it's not about leads anymore. It's about customers. I want one lead, in one customer, that's the ratio that I want, right? I want to pay the least amount of money in marketing, the least amount of money to sales, and I want to get the most new customers, but I want to get the best customers. Understanding the relative value and the attributes helps a company unilaterally agree on what their acquisition and growth plans are. So how does this all look? How does it, how does it get applied, right? Everybody talks about the funnel. I say the hourglass is the new funnel, okay? In, in, I'm not gonna, I, I don't wanna paint in too broad a brush. Most companies put account managers as like the salespeople that weren't getting it done. Just keep the customers happy, like just go over here and just be, you know, behave. I'm here to tell you that customer, uh, customer retention and growth is the single biggest secret to remaining viable. The business and smart tech convergence that we create, that the methodology that I created is created to save every single company that is not the 800 pound gorilla. The 800 pound gorillas in business, you know, they're doing SEO, they're doing paid marketing, but they have name recognition. People are going to them, they're, they're a universally accepted solution. Well, that's great, but like, what about every company that's not that? What about a generation of marketers and heads of sales in IT that are very talented people but are hamstrung by the way that their businesses are, 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 cre are basically assembled and the lack of uh, how to connect the dots on what everybody else is measuring? Well, if we have the hourglass here, we now say customer retention and growth is most important. And we split it up into whatever stages of retention and growth are most applicable for that company. In the company that, I want, that I'll give you an example of, year, year one, keeping them engaged for year one on their program is very important to them. The conversion rate to year two of their program is very important to them. What we found in looking at these segments is, is that we would have a drop off on year three and then survival of the fittest, the other people come through and it's like year six and plus. So between year three and year five is where they lost a lot of their customers. Well, why? Nobody knows. Now we have a way to be able to begin to find out. We can talk to certain customers and we can begin to test our hypotheses and we be can begin to have an ongoing voice of the customer. What's the other benefit of smart tech convergence and the way to measure? Instead of being a brilliant marketer, 
we can simply ask our customers why they, why they continue to buy with us, why they stay with us, what's going on in their world, and make them ambassadors for our company. Have them as part of the process. Have that be inclusive. That's where I would begin spending my marketing budget, is really having that 360 degree conversation with your customers and making them advocates for your business. Because the reasons why people stay with you and continue to do business is the reasons why they initially choose you. And if through the metrics and through the KPIs, because we now have an ability to measure segments of customers, and we know how many dollars worth we love them because of their performance, we are now able to say, not only do I want more of you out there, but I want you, who is currently with me, to tell me exactly what I need to tell them to be able to get more of them, and then tell me what I need to invest in internally to keep that thing going. So we're able to do that, and what we can do then is basically say, the entire buying journey, the entire customer experience is in the new world is an integrated sales and marketing uh, partnership with customer service if that happens to be in a different department. And now the IT, uh, VP of IT or the CTO of any company now has something to put his or her head around in terms of how these systems that measure things independently now need to be daisy chained together. Unfortunately, everybody lives in the silo. The discussions happen in what what does sales need to do? We need more leads. What does marketing need to do? We need more money to get more leads. Well, what can marketing do? They can get leads cheaply, but they're not gonna be qualified. And then sales points the finger. Now, this is the way to get everybody at the table. One other thing that I'll say before I, before I end, uh, end this presentation is, we live in a world today where I, my landline exists for telemarketers. People text me that are that are advertisings, advertisements more than people text me that are my friends. Every single day we are inundated with not relevant information and our privacy is invaded everywhere we go. Your customers and your customers' customers are just like you. They're inundated with the same thing. So what do we do? We get call blockers, we get app blockers, we get ad blockers. That's all marketing dollars we're flushing down the toilet. At the end of the day, you know what you like, you know what you'll buy, and you know when you'll typically do it and why you'll do it. Isn't it better to invest our time and effort and money in there, that area to understand that? And if we can basically use the new way to measure to basically tell you what customer segments are most important to us, then it's something that we can begin to make traction on. So with all of these different ways that people can waste money getting new customers, the best way to do it is basically to say, all of these campaigns, forget about the ROI on a campaign by campaign basis, all of these campaigns are going to get customers to look just like Justin. And it's one dollar sign goes into this. At the end of the day, five dollar signs come out because I got Justin's. All of those campaigns equals this, got this. We know how they behave. Is that good enough, internal stakeholders? Because so many times, marketers will be pulling their hair out with me trying to figure out how to tell the ROI story. The ROI story is a fallacy nowadays. I saw a billboard, I went on a plane, I opened up a magazine, I saw an ad, I clicked on a display ad, remarketing followed me, and then what did I do? I went direct to the website. Attribution, down the toilet. Having this new way to be able to uh, configure this helps people better uh, analyze how it is that they're gonna go ahead and spend money and to who. So, wrapping up, we can eliminate the platform process and data problems to isolate the people problem through a better way to measure. None of this is possible, though, if we're unwilling to work together. Just like the smartphone app for Waze, uh, Smart Tech Convergence can help you use customer insight, integrated reporting, and drive internal consensus. We can reboot the perspective on customer acquisition and retention challenges to give us a better, a better, uh, a better view into how successful our process platforms are uh, in data to empower our people. Measuring success is not rocket science and it doesn't require any new information. It requires us to look at the information we currently have in a different way. That's it. Thank you.